Good afternoon and welcome to all of you who are joining us for this third Thursday conversation. My name is Janine Birchie Johnson and I serve as Director of Alumni as well as Director of Campus Ministries and Admissions and Development Associate. Just a couple of housekeeping details before we get started. Please note that the, the webinar, including questions, is being recorded. And if you have a technical concern at any time during the webinar, please send a chat message to the AMBS host. If you have a comment or question for our speaker, we ask that you use the Q&A feature, which you can find by hovering over the bottom of your screen. I'll be watching for those questions and comments and I'll select the ones that I um, asked Jamie. So that all of you can see who else has joined our webinar, please use the chat function to give your name, location, and what years you were at AMBS. Make sure you have it set to go to all panelists and attendees, not just panelists. Turning now to the reason we're all here. Dr. Jamie Pitts is Associate Professor of Anabaptist Studies, Director of the Institute of Mennonite Studies, and Editor of Anabaptist Witness Journal. He is a graduate of the University of Texas, Fuller Theological Seminary, and received his PhD from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. He is also on the board of the Central District Conference of Mennonite Church USA. Jamie came to AMBS in 2012 and is valued as an excellent teacher and colleague. Jamie will start by answering several questions that I have for him, and after that, we'll have time for your questions and comments. You can submit those at any point through the webinar by using the Q&A feature. Jamie, thanks for joining us today. I invite you to start by just telling us what you'd like to know about you, what you'd like us to know about you as an introduction. Sure, well, thanks Janine for inviting me into this space. Uh, I've heard a lot about these uh, conversations and I'm honored to participate in them and looking at the list of participants and seeing the names come in. It's great to see some uh, familiar names, folks that I've had in class or interacted with over the years, as well as some, some new names. So um, welcome everybody. Uh, yeah, I mean, you kind of gave a thumbnail sketch of some of my background. Uh, I grew up in Texas. My dad actually went to seminary when I was four in Virginia uh, to become, and he became an Episcopal priest. I had been baptized in the Catholic church. Uh, he was Catholic his whole life up to that point. And uh so I spent my formative years in the, the Episcopal Church in a pretty charismatic context. Uh, and then that led me in, in the college into a, a non-denominational, kind of more Pentecostal, charismatic faith experience and church context. And it was that context, from that context, that I, I went to seminary myself out of Fuller, and that's where I met Mennonites for the first time. And I, I visited some uh, some of the Amish communities south of Cleveland. <laughs> that was really my only awareness of Anabaptism um, up until I got to Fuller and uh, met some wonderful Mennonites and other Anabaptists uh, who, who wooed me into the tradition and so that's that's kind of why i am here and i'm uh grateful to be here uh can you tell us a story of a time that you experienced god in a powerful way sure well um i thought of a couple different stories that i think maybe i'll just Tell, the, tell them briefly um, rather than telling one story at length. So I, when, uh, when I was 11 years old, my family moved from Houston to Austin, Texas, and my dad took a pastorate in Austin. Uh, and I had, you know, growing up in the church, in the Episcopal Church, um, there was... You know, I'd already been baptized, so I was looking forward to confirmation. I didn't know that at the time, but that's a really formative time period in the church. But my youth group leader was, as I mentioned earlier, kind of a, a chara the youth group I was in was deeply shaped by the charismatic movement. And uh, he 
asked me if I had given my life to Jesus. And I did not, I'd never heard that before. And, you know, now as a theologian, I might have, I do have lots to say about some of that, the theology that was surrounding that experience, but I prayed the prayer to accept Jesus into my heart. And that is one of the most powerful experiences of the Holy Spirit that I've had in my life. It felt like water was running through my body. And I said that to this youth pastor and he said, well, that's the Holy Spirit. That's what happens when you accept Jesus. And so, you know, whatever I might think theologically about the, some of the different theology of that experience, I still really value it as a, a, a genuine experience of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so, you know, I, growing up in the charismatic kind of world, I had a lot of very intense experiences of the Holy Spirit. And so I kind of had to reconstruct some of how I understand God's presence after that. And I'll say that, you know, part of that has been for me has been through spiritual direction. And just to give one example of a time where I felt the Holy Spirit, felt God's presence through the Spirit in spiritual direction was when I was uh, coming here uh, for the first time. And it was before I came here, I had an interview. I'd never been to AMBS, never been to Elkhart. And I had a vision uh, within in my spiritual direction session of um, of walking on this campus, and I, it must have been after my interview. So I think I so I'd been here once, I guess, and I, so I had a I had a vision of the campus and walking, and that God was alongside me, kind of like God's hand was with me, um, and I just had a deep sense of peace about whatever came, and I was offered the position, and so. Um, I had a deep sense of peace about coming here, knowing that I would be in God's presence. And that has been the case, thankfully. That's beautiful. And, and you've kind of touched on this already, but what attracted you to be part of the AMBS community? Yeah, well, like I said, I did first learn about Mennonites at Fuller Seminary, so in an evangelical context in which uh, there was not, well, Mennonites were not the dominant stream. And so kind of becoming interested in Mennonite theology and Mennonite church life and so forth was definitely the kind of edgy <laughs> thing to do in that context. Uh, it was kind of, it was certainly an edge at Fuller, uh, it was not the mainstream of, of either the theology or the student life and faith at the seminary, at that seminary. Um, but I was really captivated by Mennonite theology. And I was actually, I was talking to one of my professors from Fuller yesterday, uh, Juan Martinez. Juan, as some of you may know, as uh, a Mennonite brethren, originally from South Texas, um, but uh, was the president of Semilla in Guatemala for a decade and has been at, was at Fuller for a long time. And when I was at Fuller, he taught, there was enough Anabaptist students seeking ministry positions that he taught a course in Anabaptist history and polity. And I audited that course in 2005. And, uh, you know, I, I read some Mennonite theologians, but I never really gotten a broader introduction to the history and I never actually told Juan this until yesterday, but it was in his class <laughs> that I, I decided that I wanted to be a Mennonite. And, you know, part of that for me was seeing this tradition that, uh, and Juan really taught uh, an imperfect view of the tradition. He did not try to romanticize the tradition. Um, but he also talked about the history of the tradition um, and present and global present of the tradition as one that centered uh, following Jesus, worshiping Jesus, um, reading scripture and orienting our lives through reading of scripture and community and um, uh, in ways that were really deeply resonant with my charismatic background, but also felt to me like got more of kind of what I was learning through as my through my studies of scripture, the, the kind of whole message of Jesus. And so my work later in my doctoral work in 
um, Mennonite theology kind of, I was able to continue to explore some of my thoughts on that. And so when I got, when I applied to AMBS, you know, again, I'd never been to the seminary. I, the only, I lived in Washington DC for a year after seminary uh, with some Mennonites who further tried to de-romanticize the tradition for me. Um, but uh, I, uh, I'll do my PhD in Scotland. I was pretty removed from Mennonite circles. And so I had not had a lot of experience in the Mennonite world. But when I interviewed here, uh, you know, Rebecca Slough picked me up. I flew from Edinburgh, Scotland to Chicago and Rebecca Slough, the former Dean here at AMBS picked me up. And by the end of that car ride, I had, which was about, you know, two and a half hours. I had a sense of this, this would be an amazing place to work. This, is, this would be an amazing boss. And just what I was learning about the seminary community from her, um, I was very intrigued. And the more I talked to people at the seminary, but the more, you know, when I met at that time, President Sarah Winger Shank and the faculty um, and students, I was just so impressed. It felt like um, this is a place where I can continue to explore, I can continue my own journey. Um, of exploration of this tradition, this uh, my sense of calling as a as a scholar and professor, in a place that really felt like home. Um, that's that's what it felt like when I first came here, and that's that's been the case. Well, we're so glad you came. Um, tell us about the classes you're teaching this year, both in the fall and in the spring, and a little bit about each one. Oh, I gotta think back to the fall. Uh, I taught Christian Theology 1 on, I think, yeah, on, in the fall, I taught Christian Theology 1 on campus and online. And for those of you who haven't been at the seminary in a number of years, the way we do our theology now is, our kind of systematic theology is through two, a two-semester sequence that every student pretty much has to take at least the first class. Uh, so there's Christian theology one and two. And each of those classes covers a number of the kind of classical topics in systematic theology. So in Christian theology one, we talk about the doctrine of God, the Trinity, um, the different views of Jesus about Jesus, uh, and you know, salvation, sin, creation some of those topics. So yeah, I, I've been teaching kind of on a cycle. I teach that class every year on campus and every other year I also teach it online. And I will say, you didn't ask me to talk about this, but I'll say briefly that uh, I really find the online teaching extremely valuable because those students, not more valuable necessarily in my campus classes. I love campus classes. I take that for granted that all of us here have enjoyed campus classes, but um, in the online classes, let's say in theology, it's, it's really fascinating because you have people who are full-time pastors and they'll get on and, you know, we're talking about something like theodicy, like what, you know, how do we think about the goodness of God and God's power and creativity and so forth in relationship to suffering and evil. And, you know, we had course materials and then you have pastors who are, you know, oh, well, this happened to me last week. And, you know, can, can, can others kind of speak into, the, you know, this is how I responded, but I wasn't really sure. And then you might have three or four other pastors or other church leaders say, yeah, you know, I have had that, this is kind of what worked for me. And, but I was really interested in like relating it to the course materials. So I've just seen a really rich interplay in those uh, between practical ministry and the kind of course materials we use through those online courses. Um, here in the spring, I am teaching uh, Anabaptist history and theology. So probably most of you on this call took a version of that class. That's the 16th century Anabaptist origins class. Um, and I also am teaching online a course that essentially kind of takes the history and theology up from after the origins. That class is called Global Anabaptist Mennonite History and Theology. So we look at tradition formation, uh, 
expansion of the tradition around the world through migration and mission activity. Uh, it gives us a chance to, to learn about um, the kind of more immediate background for the, the global church that we engage in today. And I'm also teaching a course called Theology in Context. I created this course when I first came to the seminary and teach it every other year. Uh, this class involves uh, thinking about how we understand our social world. Um, so, you know, we use terms like society or class or race or a variety of terms uh, that come to us that we use to try to make sense of the world around us. Um, what does uh, our, what do our biblical and theological convictions have to say about how we might think about the world? Um, are there categories from scripture, for instance, the, the category of the principalities and powers? How does that shape how we see the world around us and act in the world around us? So, the class asks some questions like that, putting theological materials in, in the conversation with uh, a variety of social theories. So the class now works as a kind of introduction to social theory for peace study students. Um, and then we, we, we use Elkhart as a case study. So you've been thinking about kind of some of the theory around how we think as Christians about society. Well, what are some research methods that allow us to really dig into the context around us? And so we spend a number of weeks uh, learning about the history, using statistics, doing interviews to learn more about Elkhart. And so yesterday, my class over Zoom interviewed the mayor of Elkhart, Rod Robertson, and we had a great discussion with him. Next week, we're interviewing the cultural historian of the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi, Marcus Winchester. Uh, so we have some just really exciting conversations and ways to learn more deeply about our context. So those are the classes I've been teaching this year. I think that there would be several of us that would love to come back to seminary and do some of those classes. Um, well, I will say I'm teaching the theology and context for the first time as a hybrid this next fall. Um, so if you wanna just come and hang out in Elkhart for a week, uh, and do the rest of the readings on online and other assignments, then we'd love to have you. Great. And Jamie, you have other projects besides courses. Can you describe your work with Institute of Mennonite Studies and Anabaptist Witness and, and some other things like that that you're working on for the seminary? Sure, yeah, there's a lot, but I'll try to be brief here. Uh, Institute of Mennonite Studies, as you hopefully all know, uh, is the research and publishing arm of the seminary. We have a number of book series, um, Studies in Peace and Scripture, a new series we started a couple years ago called Studies in Anabaptist Theology and Ethics, um, and then a uh, the series The Classics of the Radical Reformation, which is a translation series that probably you all read some of when you took Anabaptist History and Theology. Uh, and I'm the chair of the committee, the editorial committee for the that translation series. So I'm, I'm pretty directly engaged in that. Um, I'm also, as part of how, uh, so, you know, part of my interest when I came to the seminary was how we think about the relationship between the seminary and the local community. That's, that's why I've shaped this Theology in Context course as I have, um, but, that class and my position at IMS has gotten me involved in a project here in Elkhart um, that is, it's an oral history project collecting stories uh, of black elders who grew up in the segregated black neighborhood. Um, so it was called Benham West. So just up Benham from the seminary, um, just south of the railroad tracks to the west of Benham, was from the 1930s through the 60s, the only place in Elkhart that, and really in all of Elkhart County that African-Americans were allowed to live. Uh, and we've heard from some elders that they wanted their stories collected before they passed on and were forgotten and felt like black history needs to be a lot more visible within Elkhart. 
And because of my role at IMS, I was asked to help give some guidance to, to this project. And so Nikisha Elena Alexis from our uh, intercultural competence in undoing racism team um, and I are giving leadership to that project. So uh, the Elkhart Black History Project is a, is a significant focus for me right now. Um, Anabaptist Witness is a mission journal that I edit. So many of you may remember uh, Mission Focus, which was a journal first started by the Mennonite Board of Missions by Wilbert Schenck in the early 1970s and then edited by Walter Sawatsky while he was at AMBS. Uh, in the 90s and until 2012. Um, I now edit that and we renamed it Anabaptist Witness. And it's uh, come, it, we have issues that come out every uh, twice a year on different themes. So our last issue was on displacement of indigenous peoples and land. And there's a number of great essays um, on that topic. And uh, we have an issue coming out later this month on worship and witness. And that one will be guest edited actually by Katie Graber and Annalie Leptison, who have been some, two of the key editors of the Voices Together hymnal project. Um, and I've been doing a webinar series with them actually. And so next Thursday, since you all seem to be available on Thursdays, uh, next Thursday, I will be interviewing them about this issue and the topic of worship and witness. So I would love for you all to tune in there. You can find us on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram and get the links uh, to register for the webinar. Thank you. I'm wondering uh, what are some dreams or a dream that you have for AMBS? Well, yeah, I mean, kind of picking up from one of the threads I just mentioned, I would love for AMBS to be more deeply integrated into the local community, more of a part. When I when I moved to AMBS, when I moved to Elkhart, you know, it was 2012, so the city was still reeling from the financial crash. And I remember going to uh, set up, you know, a bank account, going to find a dentist for the first time here. Uh, going to get sheets at Sears, which <laughs> was still open here and it's now closed. Uh, and I just remember people, every place I went, why are you here? <laughs> well, I got a job. And first of all, because of the economics of Elkhart people, in 2012, people were surprised that anyone would move to Elkhart for a job. But then I would say, well, I work at the Mennonite Seminary. The what? What's that? Well, you know, it's down on Benham kind of just south of Hively. Oh, I thought that was a, you know, a retirement community. I didn't know what that was. Um, or I even had someone say, Mennonite? Well, they're, they're down in Goshen. Are there, are there Mennonites here in Elkhart too? <laughs> you know, and, and I think that if we took that at face value, you would overlook the way that Mennonites have been deeply engaged in Elkhart for a long, long time. Um, and the seminary community has been deeply engaged in the life of Elkhart for a long time. So I don't want to under underplay that, but I, I do think there are ways that the seminary can be more deeply engaged in the life of, uh, of Elkhart and, you know, being a witness, serving, uh, learning from folks in the community. Um, and so I've been doing some work around that. As I mentioned, my colleague, Jana Hunter Bowman, in spite of the fact she lives in South Bend, she's been doing quite a bit around this through her work with uh, the Witness Colloquium, which is on a Wednesday noon event. Um, so, and, and the administration uh, has also taken this seriously over the years. So that's a vision I have. Uh, another, I'll just say one other piece that kind of goes the, you know, in, so, in some ways the opposite direction, but thinking about the relationship between the local and the global is really important to me. And I, in the last five years or so, AMBS has become, has ha had ha a much higher percentage of international students than we have, at least in the first five years I was at AMBS. Um, 
And I hope that AMBS can continue to grow as a, an international seminary in partnership, uh, still rooted in, with our denominational um, affiliations with Mennonite Church USA and Mennonite Church Canada. Um, but being part of what those denominations are doing, um, connecting through an art world conference with the broader expression of Anabaptism in the world. Um, I think partnership is going to be really important there. There's some wonderful work going on all around the world in theological education uh, that we can both, again, help serve and contribute to and learn quite a bit from. Um, and it feels like we're at the beginning of a really exciting journey um, in, in that direction. And I, I dream about, uh, where we will be with that in, in five to 10 years. It's really exciting. And do you have any questions for the alumni who've joined us today? Anything you're interested in knowing from them? Well, um, I'm always interested to know what, you learned about in seminary that you still ruminate on that still feels important um what you uh you know were there ideas or topics that you feel like uh, or resources that you got that you feel like yeah this has been something i continue to draw on um, i also think I, i'd be curious for your perspective on this i think you know sometimes we we ask students that are graduating, we always ask students that are graduating that kind of similar question. Um, but sometimes when you're in the middle of it still, or, you know, at the end of your program, you don't, you don't really know what it's going to be like in five, 10, 20 years. And the things that seem really important from seminary um, or seemed like, oh, I, I can't believe we didn't get more of this or whatever in you know, down the line, you realize you, you, you come to see things differently. And I'd be curious to hear some reflection on that. Um, were there things that, you know, when you were in seminary, you really were excited about or interested in, and then 10 years on, you thought, oh, that was, that was not as important as I thought it would be. And actually this other thing really turned out to be more important or some of what I got, I, I, you know, I, I wish I had gotten uh, something else. Uh, were there things that you would have hoped for from seminary? Um, so those are those are that's the questions that come to mind. Thanks. So now we have time for you uh, who have joined us today to make comments or ask questions. If you'd like to answer Jamie's questions that he just asked, you can do that either in the chat or in the Q and A. If you have a question for him, um, please put that in the Q and A. So I'm sure to see it there. Jamie, while they're typing in their questions, I'll start with one more. And that is just tell us a little bit about your uh, project on the Holy Spirit and your research and writing in that area. Sure. Uh, I have a book project that is tentatively called Organizing Spirit. And uh, what I've been interested in is over the years of teaching in the Anabaptist world and thinking about my own longer experience with the Holy Spirit and, you know, through the church and so forth, uh, is how we talk about the Spirit in relationship to different forms of social organization. And that sounds a little abstract, so let me try to get a little more concrete. I've noticed that in the Anabaptist world, we like to emphasize, we like to use those biblical passages that the spirit blows where she will. We really emphasize how the kind of disruptive character of the Holy Spirit. And often we reference 16th century Anabaptism here. Um, when I, there, uh, I will not say who this was, it was where I got this quote at the, from the moment, but I have a quote I've used in, in some writing from a current Mennonite leader who said, you know, Anabaptists, Mennonites, are, we're not at our best when we're institutionalizing. Uh, when we look back to the 16th century, we saw they were, you know, they had the Holy Spirit, and that meant they resisted the institutions. Now, often we need to be resisting the institutions. So my point here is not to, to cast shade or to criticize uh, uh, association of, of spirit and resistance or spirit and movement, 
spirit and the in freedom um, in, in ways from freedom from and, and freedom within institutions in ways that kind of disrupt some of our ordinary ways of of working. But I also think we we underplay both biblical and historical Anabaptist material that talks about that would that lead us to see have maybe a more positive vision for the role of institutions. And you know, to me it's interesting to hear Mennonite leaders who are institutional leaders criticize institutions as such. So I don't I neither I neither want to give a blanket kind of blessing to institutions nor do I want to uh, criticize them as such. And my worry is that we've used the language of, of the Holy Spirit to criticize institutions as such. And so I'm interested in the, the kind of multiplicity of forms of social organization that the Spirit might give rise to. And I'm using a number of case studies to kind of help flesh out the, the theology I get from contemporary systematic theology and historic anabaptism. So for instance, I have chapter on Vincent Harding, um, great black civil rights leader who spent about a decade with Mennonites in the 60s um, and was an institution builder throughout his whole life. And if you read his history books, he's constantly talking about the role of what he called freedom institutions in the black freedom struggle. So I think if we pay attention to these kind of institutions, um, we might have some kind of moral and theological guidance that helps us have a more complex way of talking about how the spirit is coordinated with our social lives. So uh, yeah, got a bunch of other case studies, but I'll leave it there for now to hear from some of your questions. Thank you. This question comes from Jacob Fraze, um, who said he's so encouraged by your ecumenical and Episcopal background and pleased to note that several of today's faculty come from other than Anabaptist traditions. And his question is, what is the present spiritual yearning of seminary students? Is their quest similar to yours, discovering Anabaptism? Or are they seeking to be educated in the interfaith world, for example, indigenous spirituality, interfaith dialogue with Muslims, et cetera? Just wondering about the yearning of our present day students, spiritual yearning. Thank you, Jacob. Yeah, thank you, Jacob. That's a great question. Uh, it's interesting. I, I think I would need, I, it has changed over time since I've been at AMBS. And excuse me, part of that is the changing demographic of the student body. I would say when I first came to AMBS, the first few years, you had what I would describe as a kind of jaded <laughs> Mennonite students who grew up in, uh, in, you know, white Mennonites from North America who grew up in white Mennonite congregations and they personally and their congregations, the majority of the people in their congregations would trace their origins back to the 16th century Anabaptist. And they were often quite jaded uh, and their spiritual yearning was, in, I think, in some ways to connect their faith to, to a kind of posture of um, a sort of political posture that had that they would have seen as had some integrity and cultural posture as well against the background of communities that they, they would have seen as kind of out of touch in a lot of ways. And so they were at seminary trying to connect some dots. They, they got in, interested in different political movements, but it was harder to see how that actually related to their faith. Uh, they they you know were more kind of assimilated into North American culture, but again, it was harder to see how that connected to their faith, even though that was really important to them. So how do you that yearning to how do you connect these pieces uh, when you've seen that the Anabaptist communities don't have it all figured out? On the other hand, there were students like me who came in kind of very hungry for what Anabaptism seemed to offer, and so I used to love staging conversations in my classes between these people who thought Anabaptism was the best thing of all time and they just learned about it and they wanted to you know learn everything they could about it and let it transform their lives and again a kind of seeking integrity I would say was was the you know for those of us who came from kind of more generic 
evangelicalism, uh, putting the pieces, again, you know, pieces around politics and culture and faith together. Anabaptism was seen as a kind of key, uh, key point in which discipleship, kind of more rigorous discipleship in community, uh, the, with, with a, a much more robust sense of ethics, uh, was seen as a, a significant step towards integrity. Uh, and then, so you have those kind of very optimistic folks then talking to these jaded folks. <laughs> There's still some of that dynamic um, in the classroom, but of course, with a much higher percentage of international students, you bring a, a number of, a, a wide variety of kind of spiritual yearnings. And what I see some kind of coalescing on, well, I, I, I would say that I think some of the jadedness is still there, but it, maybe this is, you know, we hear about millennial kind of millennials tend to be more optimistic. So I don't, maybe this is part of it, but I'd see a bit less of that kind of cynicism about the church and more of a curiosity. How, how, do, how does the church, how does my faith connect me um, to the things that I care about in, you know, that the political concerns I have, the, the cultural passions that I have, how does my faith really work at the heart of that? And then there's a role in this, especially, you know, I think of a, a wonderful international student was in the class that I just taught this morning who keeps asking, how do, how does this work for me as a pastor? And uh, that kind of the, the search, the yearning for, again, a connection between uh, a deeper intellectual foundation and framework for our faith and practical ministry um, is something I see a lot of as well. So in terms of the the, back, the original question, I don't know that, you know, we have, we have classes in, um, in Islamic Christian relations, and we're increasingly integrating engagement with indigenous sources into our courses and so forth. And these are, you know, I, I would say the, the kind of post-colonial anti or decolonial spirit is very, has become very central to what we do at the seminary in, in all of our classes um, and many of our students, most of our students from a variety of backgrounds are really interested in how do we think about Christianity? How do we have a, a faith with integrity that does not reproduce and actually fully faces the legacy of colonialism. Um, this would be a, another kind of spiritual quest that I see many of our students and certainly our faculty is being engaged on right now. Thank you very much. Uh, Janet Guthrie, um, says she's very excited to hear about the Elkhart Black History Project and oral history work with Black elders in the community. Will the AMBS library be archiving these interviews? How will the community at large be encouraged to access the information? Any thoughts about cross-generational fertilization to engage Black youth as part of the initiative? Thank you so much, Janet. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And I don't know you, Janet, I don't think, but if you have <laughs> Sounds like you've thought about this a lot. And so if you have thoughts around this, I would love to hear from you. Um, you can send me an email. Uh, so this is a, a really core issue. The, the question of archival access is a major ethical issue um, when it comes to re research on and with marginalized communities. Um, and so we've been thinking about some of these questions from the beginning. Uh, the location of any archives, uh, any public kind of events we do um, that draws attention to. So the, the idea is that we're going to be creating a book and a documentary film out of these oral histories. Um, so how do we, uh, yeah, location um, of the archive. So AMBS has done some scanning of the primary text resources we've been getting from some of our interviews. Um, Goshen College did an oral history project about a decade ago on the origins of the Black community in Elkhart, and all of that material is housed at the Elkhart County Historical Museum. 
they are trying to think about some of these questions of access as well. They've done a couple big projects, uh, exhibitions. But if you're familiar with that museum, it's out in Bristol, which is not very accessible to Elkhart's Black community. Um, it's not that far, but uh, we are meeting actually. So the some of you may be familiar with SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, that was an active force in 60s and 70s uh, Black freedom struggle here in the U.S. Uh, they have a new. They they recently did an oral history project in collaboration with Duke University, and um, th they thought through a lot of the technical aspects of this of the the access uh, community access problems. And so we actually have a meeting with them um, in a couple of weeks to talk about uh archival access so i could go into a lot of technical details here i don't think that'll be of great interest to everybody in the call but janet again if you want to contact me uh, i'm happy to talk more about this because this is a, a really important issue we're, we're trying to care for thanks roy kaufman is asking is it significant that anabaptist theology was enculturated in agrarian settings for most of mennonite history and roy is is uh one who has written about uh freeman south dakota as one of these communities yes he Thank has you, roy. <laughs> um yeah hi roy uh it's good to hear from you. Uh, I know your views on this, and I, I, I broadly would say I share them. It is significant. And in general, I think um, we are needing, you know, I say we, Anabaptist Mennonites are needing to wrestle with the significance of the materiality of, the, of uh, the, our tradition. And by that, I mean, um, we rightly talk about Anabaptist theological distinctives. We rightly talk about current global connections, global church connections as significant. Uh, and, you know, I was presenting on something on Anabaptist history a few years ago at a local church. And I was asked, well, shouldn't we just forget about this whole, all the Mennonite stuff from the last 500 years? because that's not important anymore. What's important is the global, the future. Well, <laughs> who are we and how did we get here? That requires some real careful attention to the forms of life and thought of not just people who lived 500 years ago, but the people who have lived 400 and 300 and 200 and 100 years ago. Um, seeing that they were not always as homogenous as we've made them out to be, um, uh, and which is not to say they were, you know, we need to think critically and carefully, but also appreciatively about the material conditions for the existence of this tradition. Sometimes we don't like to, we, we like to kind of sneer at the, the quiet in the land, the, the predominantly agricultural communities, um, that sustain Anabaptism, Anabaptist life and tradition for most of the last 500 years, but we would not be here if it were not for those communities. So we, there, there's kind of a, I, I think it needs to be a reckoning. And one of the things I appreciate Roy that you do in your, your most recent book is you think about the, the, the different dimensions of what is important about the agricultural basis of Anabaptist community, historic Anabaptist community life uh, in relationship to the uh, to the real moral and political issues around indigenous justice, um, the way those communities have been uh, implicated and participated in the displacement of indigenous peoples. So there is a reckoning that needs to happen. But guess what? That reckoning isn't solved if we just say, oh, well, forget the agricultural communities, we'll just be urban dwellers. And that's, that doesn't concern us because we've left the farm. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, our ecological crisis, as you also draw in your book, also forces us to ask some questions around um, the value of, uh, of agricultural life. So there's a, just a number of different reasons why we need to think a lot more carefully than I think we have 
about the relationship between rural and urban Anabaptist life and us urban dwellers. And I would count myself not just because I live in the great metropolis of Elkhart, but because I've always lived in cities. And Elkhart's the smallest city I've ever lived in. Um, we need to find a lot of ways to support and value theologically and practically the rural basis, uh, the, you know, that historic and ongoing rural reality of Anabaptist life. And, you know, I, I just saw some statistics a couple last week related to Europe. I think they were just focused on Europe, but it was through the 1950s in countries like France and Germany and the Netherlands, you had 25 to 50% of populations still living in rural agricultural settings, working on farms. Now the percentage is 2% and almost in, throughout Europe. That's a massive social and cultural change that has significant environmental impact that we have not given almost any thought to. And so uh, I think, uh, you know, Roy, and I see Troy is asking who was the question, this is Roy Kaufman. And his most recent book is The Drama of a Rural Community's Life Cycle, which focuses on his own Mennonite community in Freeman, South Dakota. Um, and you'll see some nice words from me on the back of it, because <laughs> I do really appreciate what Roy is doing here. Um, but again, I mean, there's just so many reasons to pay attention to this conversation. And the questions, a lot of us who live in urban settings rightly focused on questions of race, indigenous justice and so forth. These are, these are not alternatives. We need to hold these questions together. And, uh, and, and so, yeah, there's a lot more to say about that, but I'll, I'll let you read Roy's book and then we can have more conversation about it. Thanks. And I put both of the book titles and uh, years in the chat there. So you can look those up. Okay. Here's a fun question from Randy Miller who asks, how have you experienced the transition from being the rookie on faculty to being one of the grizzled old timers? And he especially is interested in knowing, like, do you feel like you have more freedom? Are there different expectations and so on? Just what has that been like? A lot, sure. It indicates all the transitions of the last several years. Thank you, Randy, for that question. <laughs> Hi, Randy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and yes, I am getting grizzled. You can see some gray here creeping in. Um, that certainly was not the case when I started this job at, I think I was 31, I'm now 40. Uh, and the faculty has, has dramatically changed um, where, you know, there's a couple, there's still probably most faculty members are older than I am, but I've been around almost a decade now. Um, and there's several faculty members who are much, have been on, on the faculty for a much shorter period of time. So yeah. Uh, I no longer feel like the starry eyed kid looking up at these giants of, you know, these theological giants like Gail Gruber Kuntz and Lois Barrett and Ben Olenberger. Um, and, you know, I recognize that I now carry some institutional history and I carry some responsibility for, uh, the institution's kind of continuity and sense of who it is and what it is. And I look back and I think, wow, I've trained almost a decade of Mennonite pastors. That's, that's incredible. <laughs> uh, that was not something I gave a lot of thought to, you know, at 31 of like, oh, what's, what's my legacy going to be? I didn't know how to think in those terms, but now I think about, wow, I, I, I have a, deep, much, a deeper sense of the responsibility, the gift of of the responsibility that I have in this position in a way that at the beginning it was more like I was just kind of figuring out where I was who I was what I was doing now I can kind of relax a bit more on some of those questions and think okay well what kind of legacy have I been developing and what do I want to personally and in an institution what do I want how do I want to sh help shape this institution and you know I will say from the beginning uh it's a, it, it, it is a small seminary and it's a, it's an empowering seminary. So I've been invited into leadership in a variety of ways from pretty early on, but I definitely, again, feel more comfortable in some of those roles now. And like I have uh, 
some responsibility as a more senior faculty member to help guide um, along with colleagues and uh, administrators um, the future of the seminary. So that's it's a it's a it's a good feeling, scary sometimes. And you know, I miss those old colleagues, and, and in some ways, I miss the uh, you know, kind of being able to sit back and let Ben and, and Ted and Gail kind of have it out and <laughs> figure things out. Um, not just because of the because it was nice for them to carry that weight, but because they were incredibly wise and wonderful people, and uh, and I just I really do miss our conversations as well, and wonderful wonderful colleagues now of course we we don't see a lot of each other right now because of the pandemic so it's been almost a year since we've worked in person closely together um and so i look forward to that but also just because of by virtue of the generational shift um those older colleagues are no longer around as much and that's too bad but that's how it goes Thanks. We have time for another question. If when anyone would like to put one in the Q and A, um, I'll ask one, Jamie, that um, maybe will spark some more uh, thought. But um, you have one of the gifts you bring to AMBS is your um, ability with the Spanish language, and you've made some connections with other Hispanic ministries as well. Would you share a little bit about your work in that area? Sure, well, you know, when I interviewed the first, so when I interviewed at AMBS, uh, I was not using, I didn't really draw on Spanish language literature in my PhD. I wasn't really, I was speaking Spanish kind of for fun <laughs> at that point. Um, there's lots of Spaniards and they live in Edinburgh. So I was, I was still speaking Spanish regularly. Um, but I remember Charles Bontrager, the student representative on my committee, my hiring committee, uh, in the, we weren't using zoom was probably Skype at that point, but I Skyped from Edinburgh as kind of a preliminary interview to see if they wanted to bring for them to decide if they want to bring me in. And I never forget, he asked me, how would you use your degree in Spanish and the fact that you speak Spanish? in your job at AMBS. And I was just shocked, first of all, that he had actually read like that far in my CV. <laughs> um, but also I, it was not something I had thought about. It ends up being something that has been important for my work at AMBS. So I teach the course on Christianity in Latin America every other year. And so that's become an important way for me to kind of continue to learn from Latin American history and theology and help shape students uh, to learn from and hear these voices. Um, but I've also, as you mentioned, Janine, I've also uh, connected with, so I spent part of my sabbatical a couple years ago in Mexico City, uh, working with the Siam churches. Uh, Siam is a Mennonite conference located in Mexico City. Um, and I've worked at various points with some of the leadership there. Uh, so I taught kind of lay in a Baptist history course while I was there and just related to church folks in that area. And um, I've been able to as well. So in Anabaptist Witness, we actually publish in, we try to publish in the language, any language that we receive, as long as we can find somebody that we trust that can edit it. <laughs> um, and because I, speak Spanish. So that's enabled me to connect with a lot of Spanish speaking church leaders and theologians and so forth. And we regularly publish articles in Spanish. Uh, my assistant on Anabaptist Witness, Marcos Acosta, is from Argentina. And so he's really helped us a lot in the last year or two on that project. I've, I've worked some with some of the local Latino Assemblies of God. Folks actually went to Mexico and lectured on the Holy Spirit at this big Assemblies of God church in Mexico City, and I've done an event with them on campus here in this at the seminary. So it's definitely opened up some really interesting connections uh, that I didn't expect. And it's been great as, as well with Jana Hunter Bowman coming on faculty as a fluent Spanish speaker and her deep connections in the Colombian Mennonite church um, to uh, for us to develop um, the seminary 
more broad, our relationships with the seminary more broadly. Well, I'm not seeing any uh, questions coming in from the alumni, but I'll, uh, if you can answer this one pretty quickly, uh, we have just about three minutes left. Um, can you say just a word about how the pandemic has affected the AMBS community or your, your role specifically? Well, uh, like most people, I guess, or many people connected to the seminary, at least I've worked from home. So you were seeing my office <laughs> for the last year here. This is uh, in my home in Elkhart. And, you know, in some ways that's been great. I wear sweatpants <laughs> to work. <laughs> um, and uh, I have, you know, less interruptions. So in some ways I get more work done. But obviously, you know, there's just a deep sadness over the loss of the community as probably most of you hopefully know, you know, I think that the, the most, it, the, the kind of informal relationships on campus are at least as formative um, for students and staff uh, as anything we do in the classroom. And so I, I really deeply miss those informal kind of chats with colleagues and what can come out of there, out of those conversations, the the breaks, you know, in the middle of class. Uh, I actually did, I, I, I taught the only on-campus class this year and that was in the fall. Um, and it was a small group of mostly brand new students who just moved to Elkhart and we sat really far away from each other with masks. And it worked. It was before things that kind of took a turn for the worst around the winter. And so it felt safe to do that at that point. And just being at break was was so wonderful. So uh, I miss that and can't wait to um, to be able to to engage in in person community life again. Thank you, Jamie, for answering all these questions and giving us the insights into your work at AMBS that you have. And thanks to you, our alumni, for your ongoing support of AMBS. We thank you for your prayers, especially during this time of pandemic, and for your financial support and your influence on other donors. And thank you for continuing to tap people on the shoulder that you think should continue seminary or should consider seminary study. You really are our most important influencers in the church. Tonight is the first of our alumni virtual reunions. Uh, tonight's reunion is for those who attended AMBS in the 1950s and 60s. These reunions by decade will continue almost weekly into June. It's not too late to sign up. Go to the alumni part of the AMBS website and you can sign up on that page for the virtual reunions. Next month will be our last third Thursday's conversation for this school year. And we'll be visiting with Jana Hunter Bowman, Assistant Professor of Peace Studies and Christian Social Ethics. Thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon. And thanks also to student Becca Baratu, who has provided technical support. This concludes our third Thursday conversation. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>